Okay, hello, welcome to our first session of the day, planning and designing buildings and cities for a 1.5 degree lifestyle. Uh, today, uh, I, I, we have the great pleasure to have Lloyd Alter here with us. Lloyd is the editor of architecture and design at treehugger.com, the world's largest green lifestyle website. His book, Living the 1.5 Degree Lifestyle, was published by New Society Publishers in fall 2021. Lloyd has worked as an architect, a real estate developer, and an entrepreneur in prefabricated housing. He teaches sustainable design at Ryerson University Faculty of Communications and Design, and is a past president of the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario. His writing has been published in The Guardian, Azure, Corporate Nights Magazine. Uh, with that, I'd love to welcome Lloyd. Over to you, Lloyd. Thank you. So I'm assuming you can see my slide. Anyhow, I wrote this book about living the 1.5 degree lifestyle, and you might wonder what this has to do with a green building festival, but it's my training as an architect and my teaching of sustainable design that got me to this place. Now, we have to remember the good old days when all we cared about was energy because of the Arab oil embargo. Jimmy Carter told us to turn down the thermostat and put on a sweater. We got our first taste of energy conservation as a solution to a political problem. Nobody knew what solar panels were, but they were a good thing, a visible display of being environmental. And it was all about doing with less, conserving energy. Everyone was into it, even Snoopy. Energy efficiency was the focus, and it has been for 50 years. When the Arab oil embargo ended, so did a lot of talk about conservation. It was all intensely political then. 55 mile an hour speed limits were no fun, which is why Reagan rolled back all of Carter's efficiency measures. Energy conservation and efficiency became a really hard sell when new unconventional oil technologies like fracking and the oil sands delivered tons of cheap gas and oil. Our economies ran on oil and gas production, fixing buildings was expensive, pickup trucks are all the rage, so getting people to care about efficiency was almost impossible. Meanwhile, all through this time, the temperatures kept riding, rising. Global warming was common knowledge and accepted science, but everyone was having such a good time burning all that oil and gas, nobody took it seriously, and of course it was political. The Paris Agreement finally set limits, limits on emissions, with a schedule, a carbon budget, and a target, a limit on warming to avoid catastrophe. They started with two degrees of maximum increase in temperature, and we had to start cutting immediately if we were going to stay under that. But quickly concluded, especially after 2018, that we had to stay below 1.5 degrees and or face catastrophic comp uh, complications. And this isn't a ramp down, it's a cliff. When this graph was done, the total remaining budget was 420 gigatons. And now, according to this calculator, we're down to 270 gigatons. So every molecule of carbon that goes into the air goes against these totals. Now, many will say our individual actions are irrelevant and a distraction, and we're not really responsible for our carbon footprints. It was all corporate marketing to shift the responsibility from oil companies. People would say British Petroleum invented the term carbon footprint to blame us. In fact, it was an established concept that they co-opted, originally developed by Dr. William Rees, who I actually met at this conference two years ago. And people are still complaining. Just last week, the Energy Secretary of the United States was saying, it's the big polluters, my individual actions don't matter. Everybody quotes this study, this headline from The Guardian, four years ago now, that says 100 companies are responsible because of their production. I found tweets using it to justify eating meat, having air conditioning, and even buying bitcoins. But if you look at the study that it was all based on, it's a very different story. First of all, these are not companies, they're national entities, China, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Russia, nobody's telling them what to do. We have to stop buying what they're selling. Second of all, 90% of the emissions in that report are called are scope three emissions. What happens when you burn the, the downstream emissions? It's from consuming it. 
So this is the consumption side, the emissions coming from our choices about how to get around. The consumption problem, we burn gas for heat because we made choices years ago that may have made sense at the time before we know what we know about now about carbon. Again, it's about consumption. Everyone in this conference knows how to reduce energy consumption. We just made different choices based on preferences or economics. But now that we're talking about carbon and not energy, it's not about money, it's about the planet, and we don't have as much choice anymore. Now, a few years ago, a study came out of Finland that looked at what we had to do to change our lives to keep the temperature rise below 1.5 degrees. It assumes that the emissions are caused by our personal consumption based on earlier research on what are called lifestyle emissions. And they divided that carbon budget and the schedule to reduce carbon by the world's population. And you get an average annual lifestyle emissions target for 2030 of 2.5 tons of carbon per person. This is what my book is about. I wanted to see what it was like to live that 2.5 ton budget right now so we can see where the problems are. And being an architect, I saw it mainly as a design problem. It's a developed world problem. It's the rich people who emit most of the carbon and, and consume more than the 2.5 budget. Half the world is below it, living in energy poverty. It's the richest 10%, which is considered $100,000 net worth, that emitting half the carbon, the rich 1% at 15% of the carbon. The question is how we get these people to reduce their carbon footprints. You'll be hearing a lot about this study that I based it on because they've just released an update at six o'clock this morning, our time, I was at the press conference. Um, I just grabbed a chart from it this morning. They've included Canada this time and surprise of the 10 countries that they looked at, we have by far the biggest footprints. Now, the original study listed six lifestyle footprints, how we eat, how we live, how we get around, what we buy, what we do in our spare time with the three hotspots being nutrition, housing and mobility. I built, used 2.5 tons as a target, which came out to 6.849 kilograms a day and built a giant spreadsheet to track the footprint of everything I did. But it's a hard calculation. This is a problem. If I buy an air conditioner, it's made in China now, and I can figure out its operating emissions really easily. But the problem is the emissions from making it, which are transferred really there should be on my ledger, not in their ledger. And this is what we all know in the building industry as embodied carbon. It's the critical point, but it's the issue in everything we touch and do, not just, up, not just buildings. I never much liked the name embodied carbon because it's not embodied. It's in the atmosphere now. It's counting against that carbon budget now. It's not a life cycle emission either. It's a now emission. It is upfront. Some have actually credited me with being the first to use the term up from carbon. I'm not convinced I am, but I popularized it. And it was first picked up mainly by the World Green Building Council that really listed it as the stuff right before the building is occupied, the product and construction process. It's been picked up in Canada as well. Defined upfront carbon is emitted before a building is operational and can significantly outweigh operational carbon. That's why so many in the industry are looking at mass timber and technologies like that to reduce those upfront emissions. Upfront carbon still isn't regulated, but the, at least the industry is talking about it. And if you think upfront carbon can be bigger than operating carbon in a building, take a look at my phone. 86% of its carbon is upfront, only 13% of it is operating. And if you think, if you want to see an industry where the issue is totally ignored, let's talk electric cars, where you see people correcting this Hyundai ad writing because of the carbon embodied in the materials. That's why that car can't have the same emissions as a bike. And we don't know what they are. Nobody talks about them. In buildings, they've been talking about doing labels with embodied carbon, but nobody's doing it with cars. And let's talk buildings for a moment. It changes the way you think about buildings when you design with upfront carbon emissions in mind. So you don't build stupid things that you don't actually need, like this restaurant and a stick that Foster proposed for London that was killed and that's back again. Here in Canada, you would never kill a plan for surface transit and put everything in concrete tunnels with 27 times the carbon, upfront carbon of building a surface route. You'd build the surface routes. 
you would never take down perfectly good towers to build bigger towers. You wouldn't just build bigger buildings out of concrete and steel when we have a city full of little houses that could be triplexes and little apartment buildings. We used to do this all the time in Toronto, build little apartment buildings next to single family houses. Even Tim Hudak called for this last week, saying it defies common sense that you can take a bungalow and turn it into a monster four story house for one wealthy family, but you can't build affordable townhouses for multiple families. Basically, what I've done in this exercise is I've taken this chart from the World Green Building Council on how to reduce carbon in buildings and I've applied it to my life. Don't buy what you don't need, use what you have to its best advantage and make it last, optimize material usage by the lowest carbon option and avoid waste. So I'm not going to talk about the food sector very much. This is a building conference. Diet is one of the three, but I'll just point out quickly that here, the big deal was red meat. You know, when you look at it in terms of carbon footprint per thousand calories, you find that beef is really bad. Um, cheese is actually worse than chicken. Hothouse tomatoes, because of all the gas, are actually worse than cheese. So I gave up essentially red meat. It's not about being a vegetarian. I should give up cheese, but my daughter runs a cheese shop. With every chapter, I did a list with recommendations of what people could do. Now we're into stuff that is absolutely applicable to this group. Housing is a major hotspot. And I was extremely lucky here being a baby boomer of a certain age. I live west of Bathurst near St. Clair. Bathurst used to look like this 120 years ago when it was all farms and estates for the rich like Spadina and Ardwald and Castle Loma. St. Clair looked like this at the Nordheimer Ravine. You could barely get across it. Here they were doing bike races on it. Then in 1912, they filled it all up, mostly with crap out of the coal furnaces everyone had. It's all toxic waste and garbage. They laid streetcar tracks. This guy living at the corner of Bathurst and St. Clair is probably thinking of selling and moving. This is how it looked when it was done. Nice and flat with a streetcar connecting it to the city. This is how it looks today. What developed to the West was a streetcar suburb where everyone could come home from work, pick up a few things they needed at the local shop, walk the short distance to homes to nice middle class house without parking. This is what determined the development pattern of narrow houses to increase density within walking distance. In 1890, it was mostly farms. 25 years later, after the streetcar, it was completely built out. This is my house, the one in the middle, a 1913 developer special. Like I said, I'm a lucky baby boomer and paid very little for it. And after the kids moved out, I downsized to live on the ground floor and rent out the upstairs because it was so adaptable. So what worked so well in the 20s, 100 years ago, still works well. The streetcar drives the pattern of development as the main street rapidly densifies. It also happens to be a 15 minute city. If I wanted, I could go work in Heather Doubledum's co-working space on St. Clair if I didn't want to work from home. I get to see my doctor because there's a local clinic. I can get everything I need within walking distance. The fundamental lesson I learned from Jared Walker is that trans how you get around determines what you build. It, you can't separate land use and tra transportation. So in the States, when Eisenberg, Eisenhower built out the interstate highway, and after Miss Concrete and Miss Blacktop cut all the ribbons, we got suburbia. Just as my house could not have existed without the streetcar, these houses exist because of the car. It happened in Toronto too. There was this lovely green valley. Let's put a highway in it and let's take it up to Don Mills and open up North York. And that dream has not changed. It's what Elon Musk calls the future we want, still the dream. The big single family house, only he proposes it with solar shingles, a power wall, and two Teslas in the garage. It is zero operating emissions, but vast upfront carbon emissions. The problem is it doesn't scale, which is why we have to look at increasing density. I like the Vienna model where everyone lives in lovely apartments. It's the single best way to lower the per capita carbon footprint of housing. And housing is this everything, smaller is better. We actually know how to do this. We know how to build them with low upfront carbon by using different materials. We know how to build homes with emit no operating emissions. The passive house was pretty much invented in Canada in the mid 70s in Saskatchewan. 
with sincere apologies to our lead sponsor. Once we have built our homes to minimize heat loss, we know how to heat or cool them and get hot water without fossil fuels using heat pumps. We know how to build simple forms that minimize the amount of materials that go into our buildings, like these little buildings I saw in Munich. Yet we ignore it and we hire architects that seem to do everything they can to maximize surface area and complexity. Nobody gets the message about upfront carbon, about minimizing the amount of material that goes into the building and keeping it simple. So what we can do in buildings, and we should use natural materials with low embodied carbon combined with super insulation to passive house standards. It's the only way we should build. And existing buildings reduce demand as much as possible and meet the reduced demand with air source heat pumps. And of course, apartments are better than duplexes, which are better than single family houses. Now, moving again is closely related to the design of the cities. But again, this is where it shows that efficiency doesn't really work. Efficiency failed. As cars and houses got more efficient, they got bigger. Some got gargantuan. That's why we have to focus on sufficiency. What do we need to do the job? Who could possibly need this? And again, the dream hasn't changed from 70 years ago to today. It just got electrified, the dream today. The problem with everyone loving electric cars is there's still cars that block the sidewalk. They still clog the roads. And most importantly, when you figure out the embodied carbon it takes to make them and figure out the full life cycle carbon analysis, a Tesla Model 3 is about half as bad as a regular car. It's still putting out over 100 grams per kilometer on its over life lifetime basis. And the Ford 150 Lightning that everybody's so gaga about is probably 40 tons of upfront carbon, 16 years of my carbon budget. It is a full life cycle analysis that's even bigger than my Subaru. When I wrote about this, I did a story, the abuse I got in call, comments you wouldn't believe, and even the CEO of our company sent me a message saying, why are we dissing electric cars? We should be promoting them. But if you understand upfront carbon, you know that you can't just say that. Our obsession with the car is going to smother us in carbon dioxide, whether it's electric or not. And don't get me started about rebuilding the gardener and the embodied carbon there. I don't drive much at all. I bought an e-bike. It's sufficient. It's enough for most of what I have to do in Toronto. People say you can't ride all year, but you just need appropriate clothing. This is me two years ago. Last year, it never got cold enough to even bother getting dressed like this. We also need a safe place to ride and decent transit. Again, I loved Vienna where there was a place for everyone, a lane for everyone. Toronto looked like a lot like Vienna this year, a place for everyone. Of course, it'll all get ripped out probably, but this is how it should be all the time. It just demonstrates that when you have system change, i.e. we're going to promote these technologies, you get behavior change, more people riding their bikes. Flying is almost an insurmountable problem. I used to love to fly. And after our company was bought last year, I was told to come to New York and meet the new boss Hard to say no, even though I was measuring every, cal every gram of my CO2 emissions. And what a footprint that had. 30 hours in New York took a month of carbon out of my schedule. So again, what did I find here? Get out of your car. It's the single biggest factor in most people's footprint. I didn't say get rid of it. We still have one for long trips and occasional use, but use it as little as possible and choose where you live carefully. It's the single biggest influence on how much you drive. Where you live defines how you get around. Consumption, which wasn't originally considered a hot spot, it is in the new study, was a very big deal for me. It was in fact shocking. It's probably because I have this Apple addiction. I keep buying everything they make. I have the iMac, the MacBook, the iPod Pro, and they all have incredible upfront carbon footprints. My iPhone, again, is 80 kilograms. My iMac, 824 kilograms. My MacBook Air, 174. My iPad Pro, 113. Even my dinky little watch has 38 kilograms of upfront carbon. It totals 1.1. 191 tons total over their lifetime, 400 kilograms a year, 16% of my annual budget. It's the single biggest item after my Enbridge gas footprint of 550 kilograms per year. Just thinking about it makes me want a beer. And I'm gonna talk about beer and waste and how this is such a major part of our consumption footprint. 
because the beer store is perhaps the best example of circularity and reuse that you can find anywhere. Because we take those glass bottles back to the beer store, they get washed and refilled up to 34 times, and it has an incredibly low footprint. Doug Ford is doing his best to destroy it, and we may not have this option soon, but that's not what we should be doing. Everything used to be like beer in returnable, refillable packages with home delivery long before Amazon. Coke was local because returning and refilling bottles was expensive over long distances. Beer was so local, just O'Keefe Ale had five breweries in Ontario. Then Bill Coors invented the two-piece aluminum can, gave it away to every other brewery, and changed everything. With the American interstate highway system, he could centralize brewing and ship it all over. Centralized production dramatically reduced cost. Everybody followed this plan, which is why outside of beer in Canada, you can finally find and hard to find anything in reusable packaging. With interstate highways, people took to the roads and companies made fortunes when they didn't have to pay renters or serving staff or clean tables. They outsourced the cleaning to us and we weren't very good at it and we're still not now. We had to be taught to first to pick up litter and then to recycle and they did such a good job. Instead of them having responsibility for their package, packaging, they trained us to believe that recycling was a virtue and from an early age we are trained that recycling is wonderful, that it's fine to buy single-use packages. Even Paw Patrol does it. The USGBC did a survey and it was found, it found that when asking people what we should do to lead a longer and healthier life, recycling came up on top. Instead of what it really is, which is companies training us to pick up their garbage at taxpayers' expense. We know it was all a lie that almost nothing is recycled. Only 14% is actually collected. Most of that is lost or downcycled. Only 2% actually gets properly closed loop recycling. And the industry wants to sell us on this whole idea of circularity, but it's a joke because nobody picks it up. And so if they don't get it, they can't recycle it. Their business is turning fossil fuels into petrochemicals and then into single use packages and then into garbage so we buy more fossil fuels. And if people can't even put their cup in the garbage when there are bins all over the place, how are we going to fix this? In my year, I tried to ever buy, avoid ever buying single-use plastics or drinking out of a can or a bottle. In the end, we have to lose this culture of convenience, sit down, enjoy the coffee. We have to redesign and rethink the whole system and get true circularity like we used to have at the beer store. So what can we do from computers to clothing? The question of sufficiency applies. How much do we really need? It appears that for any consumer good, the best strategy is to buy high quality with timeless design, maintain it well, and use it for as long as you can, which is pretty much what we say about buildings. I won't spend much time on leisure or services other to note that I used to drive for two hours to get electrically winched up the hill to slide down electrically frozen artificial snow and then drive two hours to get home. And the one snowy day we had last winter, I bungeed my new cross country skis to my e-bike and went up to Cedarville Park and had a lovely time. It's not about giving stuff up, it's about thinking differently. The, uh, this guy, Sebastian Gorka, an advisor to Trump, said they want to take your pickup truck. They want to rebuild your home. They want to take away your hamburgers. And you know, he's right. We do. But in the end, we want everyone to have a nice little electric vehicle that costs less, a warm home that is comfortable and cheap to run, and tasty meat, maybe beyond burgers. It's a good life that is sufficient and sustainable. So again, it's the embodied carbon, the upfront carbon emissions from making everything that are so important. My electronics use no electricity to run virtually, but the carbon emitted while making them buried me. The same is true in our homes, our cars and buildings, and just about everything made of metal or silicon or concrete. And how we live and how we get around are not two separate issues. They're two sides of the same thing. It's so much easier to live a low carbon life if you live in a place designed before the car took over, be it a small town or an older city. For the people who don't, for the servants, for the people who where the infrastructure is designed around the car, the problems of this are immense. I love this photo of Stockholm in 1928. 
If we wanted to, we could colorize it, and it could be Toronto in 2028, a city of bikes and streetcars and efficient mid-rise buildings made with low carbon materials, with everybody living a 1.5 degree lifestyle without even thinking about it. It's all about our choices. So I've added a line to the IPCC's list because I think it's so important how upfront carbon matters. Thank you all for listening. Wonderful, Lloyd. Uh, thanks so much for an uh, absolutely enlightening presentation. Um, uh, I was jotting down some notes and uh, checking off a number of my guilty pleasures, including the, the, Paw Patrol, <laughs> the Paw Patrol problem, which every time one of those packages comes in my house, it drives me absolutely bananas. I think that there's big opportunities to think different about this stuff. Um, a lot of questions were streaming in, so I'm going to start uh, uh, knocking off a, a couple of them here. Um, there was a question about um, if you were aware of any sort of app uh, to help support uh, carbon tracking, uh, perhaps in a similar fashion uh, to the spreadsheet approach you took. There are a couple of them that are out there that aren't very good. Um, I've been working for the last uh, two months with an organization, the hottercool.org, who actually are the people who put out that document this morning. And we've developed a uh, spreadsheet that is going through trials right now that we're going to be releasing publicly in about three weeks. So uh, there are some, I'll, before this day is out, I'll put some links to some of the apps that are out there now. But they're they're not very good because they don't look at it in detail. They just say, how much do you drive a year, et cetera? Yeah, right on. Um, while you were going through that journey of quantifying your GHG footprint, um, did you find any surprises? And I think perhaps was there an easy thing or two to give up that, that actually had a pretty big impact? Well, the single biggest impact that of anything was getting out of the car and getting on the e-bike, which it turns out I really love doing. It's much more fun than sitting in traffic in a car. So, you know, all year round, I love doing that. And that was the single biggest thing. You know, when you look at your diet from a climate point of view, instead of saying I'm going to be a strict vegan, it actually wasn't that hard to give up just red meat. So I eat a little more chicken. You know, it would be better not to be eating any meat. But if you're like me and that's really difficult, you do the things with the biggest impact there. I would never have been able to get anywhere close to the 2.5 ton uh, target had I not a few years ago when the kids moved out, subdivided the house to where I'm living on the ground floor and uh, rent out the upper two floors because it's the only way the gas bills got low enough that wouldn't just blow me out of the water right now. So the size of the space you live in is really important, but that's not something people can easily change. I just lucked into it that I bought in the right place that I can walk everywhere and get everything that I need. So that's where it becomes the design of our cities is so important that we just can't keep building car dominated suburbs. We have to build like we did 100 years ago. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think some of the old business adages of you can't man manage what you don't measure are really coming to mind. And I think that notion of just starting to track and quantify and having a target, uh, it's impressive. Uh, a question, what was your biggest challenge uh, as you started to adopt this 1.5 degree lifestyle? Well, the biggest challenge, I absolutely have to be honest, was not being able to travel. I love flying. I used to speak at all the Passive House conferences and they'll go everywhere and uh, I loved doing that. And, you know, it wasn't me that stopped it. It was the pandemic, basically. I picked a very convenient time to try this exercise because you couldn't do anything and go anywhere anyway. So um, that worked out very well, but the not flying, you know, I just before I started the thing, I went off to Lisbon to speak at a Passive House conference there, and that's two tons out of my 2.5 tons budget just gone on one one week trip to Portugal. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be the hardest thing for people to give up, I think. When you look at the table that came out that showed Canada 
the carbon footprint of the average Canadian, which was included in the latest 1.5 degree report I mentioned, I mean, it's almost all driving and meat. If you look, we way too much meat and we drive way too far in cars that are too big. And that's, you know, our country and our culture, and that's going to be a very hard thing to change. Yeah, absolutely. Why don't we try to do one more question uh, fairly quickly? They're all, there's so many streaming in. Um, maybe a quick question about where did you get the carbon quantities uh, for your spreadsheet, Lloyd? Oh, well, that is one of the toughest things of the whole thing. There's a book uh, I started with. Um, how bad are the bananas? Can you see that? Yeah. Um, yeah, this is a really interesting book by uh, an English Mike Berners Lee, and he basically looked at everything and put carbon budgets on it all. And then there are a couple of other sources, but most of it is just wild guesswork uh, in a lot of ways. You have no idea. I tried to do a real exercise where I measured the carbon footprint of Swiss Chalet takeout in the book. And, you know, okay, so first I have to find out where the chickens come from, how much does a rotisserie oven use? And then all of this going through measuring, weighing the plastic that it came in. And then the whole thing was completely knocked out because Swiss Chalet doesn't do their deliveries from the closest place. They do it all from over Mount Pleasant and Eglinton. So I had a seven kilometer round trip to get my chicken. And by far the biggest thing was the delivery. So what, to answer your question, figuring out exactly what the carbon footprint of all of this is, is impossible. On the Tesla, you know, if they made the battery in one place, it's going to be half of what it is if they made it in another place where they don't have solar panels on the roof. So the best you can do is take educated guesses, really. I have to be yeah. honest about that. You're bringing back nightmares of my master's degree, so we should cut that question off. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, thanks so much, Lloyd. Uh, I can say from my experience, fantastic presentation, and you can tell from all the questions streaming in that uh, people really enjoyed it. So thank, thank you so much.